Today's gospel reading will be found on Mark 10, 46-52, in your few Bibles on page 934. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son David, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Amen. Amen. We've read stories where we've seen Jesus' power to heal corresponds with his power to forgive. This isn't one of those stories. We're tempted to read this as an ordinary healing story. A blind man sees, and it's not the first blind man that's recorded for us in Scripture, in the Gospels, where we see a healing like this. Only this one is a little bit different. It's deeply deeply ironic. I want you to just pay attention to a couple of the larger features. We have a young man, Bar Timaeus, son of Timaeus. He's a beggar because his eyesight is not good enough for work. Whether he's what we would call legally blind, whether he's total darkness, it does not say. The irony, of course, is laid out for us right here at the very beginning because this son of Timaeus this, is sitting by the roadside begging. You get the picture. A blind and presumably helpless character. And he hears that Jesus of Nazareth is in town and he calls out something incredible. In fact, he doesn't just call out, he starts shouting. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. The blind man shouts, Jesus, son of David. This is a new theme in the Gospel of Mark. Up till now, we've seen Jesus as teacher, Jesus as prophet, extraordinary teacher. We've seen Jesus maybe even fulfilling messianic predictions and roles. So Jesus as Messiah, or as we say, derived from the Greek, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ. And now we have Jesus, Son of Man, what we talked about a week ago. That text borrowed from Ezekiel where the prophet is referred to as Son of Man. And from Daniel, have a messianic overlay ambiguous enough to be intriguing to the ear of the listener and to guide the ear of the listener, but not so explicit. Yes, he's a Messiah, a son of man, one who is like a son of God. We have that overlay. And now the blind man says out loud something remarkable. Son of David. Jesus is Bar David. Now, if we go to the genealogies found at the beginning of Matthew and the beginning of Luke, we go through particularly, we can find that if we go back a ways, Jesus' ancestors do indeed include King David. He is of royal blood and royal line. And so we have something unique beginning to take shape 
in our text and in the mind of our disciples who journey with him. In our text, we see uniquely shaping up as someone who's not just a great teacher or a prophet with shmika, great power, or a Messiah who could save people from Roman oppression or so forth and so on, or if we take the messianic overlay of son of man could be one like God. We come now to his kingly credentials. Jesus is also a son of David, an ancestor of the great king of the golden age of Israel that occurred with David and Solomon. When people from far and near came to see not only Israel's wealth, but to seek the wisdom of her kings. It is the blind man who introduces us in Mark to David, a Jesus son of David. Now that's the irony. One who cannot see, sees. Do you see where Mark is going with this? Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, and he shouted it all the louder. I like this guy. Now sometimes this guy is the most annoying person on the planet. But sometimes, every now and then, this is the guy who actually gets it right. This is the guy who speaks a truth to a nation and a people that cannot otherwise apprehend it. And so Bartimaeus, helpless as he seems, points to us and says to him, Have mercy on me. Now, notice that phrase. It isn't, Hey, Jesus... Can you, can you heal me? Can you fix my eyes, please? I might have prayed that one, being the occasionally selfish creature that I am. What would you have prayed? He didn't say, Jesus, forgive me. Or he didn't say, forgive my parents. He just said, have mercy. Now, we're reminded of a prayer in another part of Scripture where two men went into the temple to pray. And one of them was a Pharisee who stood in the corner and said, Lord, I thank you and I praise you that I am not like the Gentiles over there or the women over there or the sinners out there. I thank you. I'm not like any of them but that you have made me better and special and different. Amen. And there's another man who goes into the temple and he beats his breast and he says, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Jesus says, one guy left that place renewed and forgiven. And one guy left the same. And the one who left renewed and forgiven was not the one who was saying a prayer of thank you, was the one who was saying, have mercy on me. Bartimaeus says, Lord, have mercy on me. Jesus stops and decides to call him. And this is where I wonder if actually he's world of darkness blind or just severely sight impaired. But they called to the blind man, and can you imagine? They've been ignoring him. They've been telling him to shut up. You've been in the corner. You've been, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Oh, shut up, they've been saying. Mind, mind yourself. Be quiet. They've been, they've been trying to suppress his voice. And now these same people turn to him and say, oh, guess what? Be of good cheer. Jesus wants to see you. <laughs> okay, you're not laughing. <laughs> how many times, how many times do we inadvertently 
keep people from accessing God or play gatekeeper because of our sense of who is worthy and who isn't. Our sense of whose voice ought to be heard or ought not to be heard. How many times do we play gatekeeper to the kingdom? And Jesus stops in this moment and says, no, call to him. Let him come. So I laugh. Cheer up on your feet. He's calling. I don't know if this is one of those stick things on your feet or if he can see in general enough to sort of know it's daylight and sort of avoid major objects. I don't, I don't know. It doesn't say. But he comes to Jesus and Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And here the irony comes again. Rebbe, I want to see. I want to see. I want to see. Jesus said, your faith has healed you, and immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. There are animals in the animal kingdom that imprint. It's how they connect to a parent. Ducklings and so forth imprint with the parent duck when they're hatched. And they follow that parent everywhere. It's like the blind man now sees and he's imprinted into Jesus. He's just following him along the road. He doesn't know what else to do. This is now the one who has made him and the one who has called to him and the one who has healed him. And the one who has recognized that all along he was the one who saw. It wasn't the seeing person or the disciple or the Sadducee or the Pharisee who said, Jesus, son of David. It was the blind man who saw the king. As, yeah, as they approached, oh wait, second gospel reading, Mark 11 through 1 through 10. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. <clears throat> they went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they, when they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches. They cut it in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Osana, blessed he is, blessed he is, he Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is blessed in the coming kingdom of our father David. Osana in the highest heaven. Amen. We refer to it as the triumphal entry. Jesus coming into Jerusalem as a king. But Mark has not given us much time to get to know this king. A few repetitions of a few major themes, a few cycles of miracles that help point to the reality and the truth, but we're moving very quickly now. The son of David is about to surrender his life. For a week later, as he enters Jerusalem, not a week later, the fickle crowd that sings Osana to God in the highest 
will cry out, crucify him. You see, messianic expectations are painful when they're not met. Jesus has entered and people has received him as a, have received him as a king. A king who is a teacher of his own rabbinic school. An interpreter of the law like no other. A teacher with shmika, a prophet. A Messiah figure. One who fulfills the description of son of man in Daniel and Ezekiel. And after the fact, we'll see Revelation. One from the line of David, the priestly line, actually the kingly line, from which the Messiah is prophesied to come. So we have among us now teacher, prophet, priest, and king. Remember in Daniel's vision, he sees one standing as a son of man, and the one in the, the son of man who's pictured in Revelation is one wearing a white robe with a golden sash. It evokes for us the images of Hebrews, in which we see Christ as priest. And so the Messiah, the priest king, the son of David, is about to be crowned. What Mark shares will be interesting in the light of the testimony that Jesus will give later before Pilate and Herod and the Roman Empire's interest in this newly proclaimed king. But Jesus is not phased. He knows who he is. He knows what he is doing. And he knows that his time has come. It will not be long before the son of David is declared son of God. Our third gospel reading will be in Mark 12:13 to 17. Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew the hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a Darius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, Whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Amen. Amen. Mark is the gospel of amazement, and they were amazed. It's first the apostles who are amazed. They're amazed because they're puzzled. They don't know the meaning of things. They're amazed because even the wind and the waves obey him. They're amazed because he has walked toward them on the lake as they are in the boat as one who is a ghost but isn't a ghost. They are amazed at his teaching. And now... It's another group that are amazed. There's two things going on in this passage as I think about it and reflect on it. One we've traditionally talked about in terms of the work of the Pharisees and the Sadducees who from the beginning of the book we read, that first healing on the Sabbath day, are determined that Jesus should die and looking for an occasion to kill him. They are constantly working to discredit Jesus constantly working to make the crowd somehow become disaffected with all that he is and all that he teaches. If they can get Jesus to say, yes, you have to pay the taxes, he will be perceived as a Roman sympathizer. He will be perceived as somebody who's a sellout to the empire and he will not be loved and respected. If he 
one who has just entered Jerusalem as a king, should dare to say, no, Caesar is not to get your taxes. Their problem is now solved by the Roman government very efficiently. The Romans have no patience for insurrection. Some of you have probably seen some of the Smithsonian or Discovery Channel programs on the Roman Empire. They built roads out of stone going miles and miles and miles through Europe. They built bridges into Germany. They built all sorts of things so that they could take an entire garrison of troops in an incredibly short period of time anywhere in the world that they had conquered, anywhere in the world they wanted, and extract taxes or shut down an insurrection, they were brutal, efficient, lethal. They were the United States Army of today. They didn't have drones, but they had everything close to it. They could go anywhere in their empire and stop anybody from anything. If you've been to Israel and you've been to Masada, the last stand of a group of just a couple of hundred rebels, they spent, in today's dollars, presumably billions of dollars, with eight Roman camps around Masada, building a ramp out of earth, and marched up to the top to kill these people. The message was very clear. Nobody is going to mess with Rome. Nobody. The people weren't stupid. They knew that if Jesus would say, don't pay taxes to Rome, that would be the end of the king. The Romans would have his head, they would have him executed, and their problems would be over. Jesus, son of David, would be dead son of David. Jesus, ever wise, ever spirit-filled, ever God made flesh, asks for a coin. He sees their trap. He understands their hypocrisy. He knows the journey that he must take, but not quite yet. Give me a denarius, he says, whose picture is on it. Caesar's. We could do the same today. Give me a quarter. Whose picture's on it? George Washington. Well, Give to George Washington what belongs to George Washington. And give to God what belongs to God. They were amazed. Jesus, son of man, would give a wise answer. Jesus, son of David, would give a wise answer. Jesus, the Messiah, would live another day on his way to the cross in which a different kind of inscription would be placed. Not an inscription on a coin that says Caesar Augustus or whoever Julius or whoever the reigning monarch of the coinage was. But the inscription would say, this is he who was king of the Jews. Jesus, son of David. I love Mark's gospel. When we first started this journey, we talked about how his gospel was for those of you with ADD or ADHD. This is the gospel for those of you who don't want to take too many detours. This is the gospel for those of you who for a couple of repetitions, now you've got it. This is the gospel for those of you who want to see a journey in a few steps. This is the gospel in which ordinary men called by an extraordinary God went in a period of just a few years from seeing this as an opportunity for themselves intellectually and socially to ultimately being prepared to lay down their own lives as they followed the one who was and is and is to come. This 
is a journey of conversion, a journey we all have to make as we take our own steps, as we do our own work, as we listen, as we learn, as we read. Mark, in just 12 short chapters, has brought us to this point. And Jesus, son of David, will soon be understood. Not as a Messiah for this earth, not as one who would overthrow Rome, but as one who, as Daniel foresaw, would be the king of a kingdom, like a rock cut out without hands, falling to earth and filling the whole earth, as it were. A metaphor for a kingdom which will never end, a kingdom which will fill the whole earth, a kingdom for which there will be no other as great before it and no other that will ever follow it. For he's not a king of a temporal place. He's a king by birthright, by declaration. He's a king for all time. Let us pray. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on us. Teach us, show us who you are. As we journey, we pray your healing. We pray for the vision of the blind. We pray for the capacity to see. And in seeing, we might understand. And in understanding and seeing, we might follow and in following, we might be transformed. Continue to mold us and change us and grow us in your grace. These are the things we ask in the name of the one who was and is and is to come. The Messiah, not just for Israel against Rome, but for Israel and spiritual Israel to follow and all who would come to believe. Amen.